Hey, what's going on? My name is Izzy, and today I thought I'd talk a little bit about dependency injection and inversion of control, and how you can use that to eliminate global variables and singletons in some of your code bases. So we're going to be going over two code bases today. The first one on the right here is a bit of Go code, and this Golang code is some pretty typical HTTP handling code. It just sets up an HTTP server and has an API and a logger, so it logs out uh, information about the application. On the left here, we have a bit of game code, which is written in C sharp. And this is also a pretty typical uh, piece of game code in which we have a game manager. And the game manager does things like manage whether or not the game is paused. And we have a singleton there, which we're gonna eliminate. We're gonna take out that singleton and replicate the functionality. Okay, let's start off with a quick overview of how this code works. So here's our main function, and you can see that we have a logging package, and we're calling init logger. And init logger is defined over here in the logging file. As you can see, that sets up the logging instance, which is a pointer to a logger. Um, it just creates a new logging instance and gives it a prefix, which is a string we pass in here. It's just called log. So the logger itself is super simple. It's just a struct. The prefix is a field, which is a string, and it has a method on it called log f. So in C sharp, you might be used to this uh, method itself being embedded inside the logger or in Java as well. And basically, it's just a method on the logger that you can call to log out some data. It logs the prefix, the format, the arguments, and the new line. So a very simple printf function. So we're initializing that pointer to be to point to a new logger instance. And then you can see that we're logging out the server starting on port 3000, setting up an HTTP server with a basic handler, jump over to the handler, you can see it also relies on the logger. And we're getting the request URL, printing that out and printing status OK. So here I have it running, uh, we can see the server started on 3000. And if I go ahead and jump over request for localhost slash wombat, you can see that we get slash wombat. On the other hand, if I request for slash dog, then you can see that we log out slash dog. Pretty simple, and it seems to work absolutely fine. So let's talk about why you might not want to do this. So let's say we wanted to test our handle request function to make sure that it gives us the correct status code. Maybe it does some things that we want to test, make sure it's handling some URLs correctly, and that this this little function is, is working so that when we go to upgrade it and increase its functionality or change or refactor the code, we're 100% sure before we deploy that it's working as it was working before, so we just run the test. So here's the test. All it does is create a new recorder and new request. It requests get slash wombat, um, runs the handler function, and checks if the status is OK. Super simple. Just make sure that it has status code 200. And if it doesn't, then we fail the test. So this is super simple stuff. And at a glance, it looks fine. Our, our, our editor isn't giving us any, any problems. Our Go compiler isn't screaming at us. Nothing looks like it should be wrong here. But when we run the test, you're going to notice that we get a segfold. So if I, if I run the test, you can see that we get an invalid memory address or nil pointer to reference. Or in C++ terms or C terms, it would be segmentation fault and the whole thing would crash and burn. So why is this? Why do we have a nil pointer to reference? Well, it's actually quite insidious. And if we, if we did debug the test, we can drop a debugger right here. We can drop a breakpoint and we can run the debugger. Okay, so we've hit the breakpoint in our debugging and you can see that we've uh, gotten to the part where we, re where we log out the request URL, nice and simple. And there it is. We have the test runner. It's failed. We've got a panic. And if we let this go, we can see that we're at a fatal panic and the entire thing crashes and burns. The reason we crashed is because the logging uh, instance, here a logger instance, was nil when we went to handle the request because we actually didn't call in our test in it logger. So the environment wasn't set up in the test. And in order to fix that, what we'd have to do is import di slash logger slash logging and call logging dot init logger and we'd have to give it some sort of prefix which doesn't matter so this works but there's two major problems here for one this isn't testable if we want to test that the api does actually log out the correct thing it logs out the url there's no real way to do that we have to create an event in our logger and hook into it or maybe we'd have to log to standard out and check the standard out or something like that it'd be a total pain and on the other hand let's say that our logger depended on say an aws connection in order to forward the logs to some sort of query then this would be almost impossible you'd have to set that up in your testing environment every time you wanted to just test the api you'd also have to be setting up the logger, which is just pretty ridiculous. Why should you have to set up all the logger's dependencies just to be able to test the API? Let's figure out how we can do this a little more succinctly and testably, 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 in a more testable way. <laughs> okay, so looking at our API, we can easily say that the API depends on the logger, as in order for the API's handle request function to function correctly, 
it requires the logger instance. We've already seen that because when it didn't have one, it crashed and burned. So we know that handle request as a function depends on the logger instance. So how could we inject, how could we give the API, the logger that we want to use for that particular call rather than having to uh, create some sort of global variable that we can't really manage properly? Well, the first thing we're gonna do is just get rid of our global variable. We'll remove it. And instead, we'll set up init logger to instead create a logger. Creates a new logger. So this is going to return a pointer to a new logger. And we can simply change this logger instance to just return new logger. So this all checks out fine. We now need to go into our main.go function and remove the logger setup. And instead, we're going to simply create a new logger. Logging.createLogger. And we'll give it a prefix of log, like we did last time. And then we can change this call to simply be logger.logf. That's great, but what about the API? Now, there's a couple of ways that you could do dependency injection here, that you could inject the dependencies into handle request. So one way to do it, the, the, the maybe slightly naive way, would be to create a function around the function, which returns that function. So this is what's called a closure, a function which returns a function, and the dependencies are going to be injected via the closure. So what we're going to do is change handle request to create handler, and we're going to have that take in a logger, logging.logger, and return an HTTP handling function. And then in the body of the function, we'll simply return a function which performs our request. Then we'll set the logger.logf there, and we can comment this as create handler generates a, an HTTP handler using the provided, provided logger. Okay, so we've now got a function which returns a handler which takes in a logger. Now, this is okay, and this works, but there is another way that we can do this that may be a little more useful to understand. And also, it is a little bit more... Uh, familiar to those of you who write in C Sharp or Java. So instead, what we'll do is we'll create, let's say, handler, which is a struct. And what we'll do is we'll have that structure have an instance of a logger. So we'll say logger is logging.logger, and it'll be a pointer to a logger. Then instead, we'll take out our function, which returns our function, and instead set this new function to be a method of the handler. So we'll say h star handler handle request. And instead, we'll say h.logger.logf. All right, now all we have to do is create a constructor. This isn't strictly necessary, but it does help. Uh, we'll create a create handler uh, constructor, which takes in a logger and returns a handler, and then returns a new handler with the logger set, just like we did for the actual logger itself. Okay, then in the main.go function, we will simply call api.createHandler, passing in the logger, and that will return the handler, which we can then use in our HTTP server. Okay, so this does still work the same way. If we go ahead and go run main.go, we can see that it all runs perfectly fine and the logging works. However, our test actually will still break. If we go over to our API test, remove the init logger call, and create a new handler, we still have to create a logger, which is kind of a total pain. If we don't create a logger, then we will have a nil pointer to reference, and yeah, it's still not the best, because what logger do we give it? If we give it the logger that it needs, it still might have those dependencies that I mentioned before. It's still a total pain. Okay, so going back to our API, let's really think about it. We said that the API depends on having a logger, but it doesn't. It only depends on having the logf function. And the API doesn't actually really care what that logf function does. It doesn't really matter to it. As long as it has some function for some logging, it doesn't really care. It's got a signature. It's called logf. It takes a format and then any number of arguments to that format string. But other than that, it doesn't actually care what it does. Why should it? It's not the API's job to care about what the logging actually does, as long as it has a logger. So this is where an interface comes in. Let's define a contract saying that as long as it has this logf function, I don't care what it actually does. We could do that with an interface. So let's create an app logger 
interface and put this logf method string, sorry, method signature into our app logger as a function signature. And we'll say app logger defines the contract tool methods for a logger in the application. Okay, so now we have this basic interface. It doesn't actually do anything. It simply defines some method signature. It doesn't implement it. Then in api.go, we can simply swap out logging.logger with logging.applogger. And we can do the same in our constructor. And as you can see, my editor won't complain and my, my compiler won't complain at all about main.go or any other parts of my application because of course, they still satisfy that, that, that API. They still satisfy that app logger interface. So this is great. This allows us to write a fake logger for our testing. And this is super simple. All we have to do is create a fake logger, which is a struct. It can have absolutely no dependencies, no prefix, absolutely nothing required. And it simply implements that one interface. So we'll say fl star fake logger. And again, we need the log f function, which takes a format string and any number of arguments. Do nothing. There you go. Doesn't have to do a thing. And we'll say fake logger. Fake logger is a dummy logger for testing. And then we'll say log f does absolutely nothing. Simple. So now the API doesn't care whether it gets a logger or a fake logger, because both of them have this log f method that satisfies the app logger. As long as it gets an app logger, it doesn't care whether it's a fake logger or another logger or any other logger, and it makes it much easier to write our test. Now, all we have to do is create the handler. So we'll say API, or we'll say actually handler is equal to create handler, and we'll pass in a new fake logger logging dot fake logger like so sorry i spelled handler wrong and i also spelled fake logger wrong <laughs> going well here today then when we test our code we'll simply call handler dot handle request like so and as you can see we've created a new api handler right so in our api test we've called this create handler and instead of giving it the normal logger a pointer to a normal logger all we're doing is giving it the fake logger, a new fake logger. It's empty, it doesn't do anything, it's just a dummy logger for testing. And when the API gets this logger and we call handle request, the logger it's going to have injected into it is just going to be this fake logger, which does absolutely nothing. And so now we don't have to test the logger when we test the API. Uh, we have a completely blank dummy logger. And if we want to test the logger, we can actually have this logger return some string or hook up some event or something like that. So we run the test. No crash, no null pointer exception, because we've given it a logger and we didn't have to set up any dependencies. We don't care about any environment. We don't have to do anything. And we get no crash. Our test just passes. Perfect. Just like that. I really hope that helped you understand. And this is probably a perfectly fine point to turn off the video. But if you're still confused and you want to see this implemented in a language that's more familiar like C Sharp or Java, I'm going to implement it in C Sharp now just to really hammer this home. But if you are going to stop watching here, I really hope it helped. And thank you so much. All right, let's get into the C Sharp implementation. Alrighty, so jumping over to C Sharp, I've got an example of something that you might see in a video game like uh, Unity or some other sort of make this a little bigger. There we go some other sort of uh, game engine, or even if you're rolling your own. So here we have a pretty simple app that makes two weapons and two orcs, and each orc can attack. Um, so orc one attacks the position of the second orc. The orcs are pretty simple. They just have a weapon with uh, and an X and Y position, and then their attack method, it checks the game manager, so it gets the instance of the game manager, checks if the game is paused, and if not, it attacks. Pretty bad practice if you're uh, if you're if you're paying attention, but um, you know you may have seen this kind of code a lot. Even in the Unity official tutorials, they do this kind of stuff. It's pretty bad. So the interesting thing here is the game manager. It's basically your typical uh, singleton pattern. Uh, basically, what this does is create a instance of itself, the game manager, um, which is a static instance. So this class has a static instance to its own class, and uh, we have this static get manager, which returns that instance. So there can only really ever be one active instance of this class at a time, unless for some reason you created another one, in which case it wouldn't really matter. Um, but again, this is pretty bad, pretty untestable, because 
this game manager very likely has a ton of dependencies and every time you just wanted to test out the orc in isolation you also have to make sure that the game manager is set up and that would be a total pain because if you wanted to just create an empty scene and drop an orc down and see how they react and whatever you'd also have to set up the game manager and everything the game manager needed so let's do this a little bit better we're going to start by creating um let's see i game state Dot cs and we're going to put that under our normal namespace and we're going to create a public interface called iGameState and inside this interface we're going to define a method called um, get pause state and it will return a boolean like so then inside our orc class we're going to have a private reference to an iGameState private iGameState And instead of asking for the game manager if it's paused, we're going to refer to this game state dot get pause state. Okay. And then in the constructor, we're going to take an i game state. We'll put that at the start, i game state. And we'll set this dot game state equal to game state. And I also forgot this dot x equals x and this dot y equals y. So here we have our i game state now and our orc instead checks for uh, get pause state. So in our game manager, what we're going to do is have that implement i game state. Okay, so now we're implementing the interface. So we want to get rid of the singleton stuff. And instead, I'm just going to run um, public, what is it, bool get pause state to implement that i game state. And I'm going to return this dot is paused. Cool, nice and simple. So this isn't a singleton anymore. And our orc simply needs a game state dependency injected into it. So inside our app, we'll just want to create a game state. So we'll do games, uh, game manager, uh, manager equals new game manager. And then when we create our orcs, all we have to do is make sure we give them the manager and of course an X and Y position. So I'll just give them 10, 20, we'll give them manager 10, 25, 40. There we go. So our orcs now are given their manager. They have a manager injected into them, and all they really need is the i game state part. So you can see i game state just implements get pause state. The orcs check that the pause the game is not paused. Obviously, this should actually be if not get pause state. Um, and now they have that game state dependency injected. So if we were doing a test and we wanted to quickly spin up an orc without having a giant uh, game state, we could pretty much pretty easily make our own implementation of it by simply creating a public class called fake state and inside that we can implement i game state by public bool get pause state and we can just always return false and then instead we can simply swap out the manager for the fake state if we want just like that. And so this is pretty good. This is a pretty easy way to stub out that dependency. And now we don't have to worry about the orc um, not having a game manager that's fully fledged and all of its dependencies are set up. Um, and you don't have to have a singleton floating around in global namespace, which is kind of a, a bad, bad practice in my opinion. So the Unity, the Unity official docs tend to encourage uses of singletons, things like that. So I just wanted to show you how you can avoid using a singleton, just using normal everyday C sharp code, but it may not be the most intuitive to you. Um, so this is the practice of inversion of control. So the orc doesn't actually care what the game state is, as long as it has a method that allows it to get some pause state, and that's all. Again, maybe it's a little bit contrived, but I hope you get the point and why it can avoid singletons. All right, the video's gone on long enough. I think this will hone it in, and I really hope that you found this video helpful and that you can implement this in your next projects and you start thinking about dependencies and how your objects depend on other objects. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. If you like the video, drop a like, and I'll see you in another video.